From TE Connectivity, this is Maker to Maker, conversations between engineers about engineering and the beautifully messy process that is design. Subbing in as host for Brooke, I'm Justin Loloff. But Brooke isn't far. Today, we're flipping the tables, and I have the pleasure of talking with mechanical engineer for new product development at TE Connectivity and host of this very show, Maker to Maker, Brooke Glassman. Welcome, Brooke. (laughs) Thank you, Justin. I'm excited to be here. Tell me a little bit about you know what you do with TE and um, and kind of flip the tables on you and and answer some questions on on your job. Yeah, this is this is fun because usually that's my first question to the guests. So a fair first question to me. Yeah, at TE. I'm a mechanical engineer. I work on new product development currently in our industrial, commercial, and transportation group, uh, more specifically on data connectivity products. I've been in this role for four and a half-ish months, four months. Um, And previous to that, I was with our automotive team working on terminals, connectors, and headers. So yeah, it's been a really fun experience. I've been at DE for a total of four and a half years. I really found TE through the Society of Women Engineers, actually, at a conference. It was very unexpected. And that's how I got my first internship, which was with with our automotive data connectivity team. So, yeah, it's kind of come full circle. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, being the host of Maker to Maker. How's that experience been? Um, And maybe what are some of the favorite parts of, of all the conversations that you had with all the different engineers? Yeah, being the host has honestly been so much fun. I mean, this was a really different experience. I feel like a lot of people don't necessarily get a chance to do this. And I credit one of my mentors and one of the people that I'm really close to at TE for even recommending me as the host of this podcast. I think this came about as kind of a creative idea and they were looking for an engineer who would maybe jump on this opportunity and I guess that was me. So it, it kind of came about surprisingly, but it's been so much fun. It's been so up my alley to be able to, one, meet a lot of different people. I love just the idea of meeting people, learning about what interests them, learning about what makes them tick, and really getting to hear a lot about different types of engineering and different types of jobs across the entire country. So it's been so much fun. Uh, I think some of the things that I've kind of learned, and it's given me such a different perspective as like the interviewer, because I've never really been in that position as like a younger engineer. If anything, I've only been interviewed for jobs. I haven't really had a chance to be the interviewer. So it definitely makes it easier when you're talking to people when one, they're very enthusiastic about what they're talking about. That's always a quality I say you can't you can't teach. Like you can't teach enthusiasm. And it definitely makes it, I think, easier as the host when you get someone who's really excited about whatever it is they're talking about. Even if it's not something I'm particularly interested in, it makes it makes you want to listen to them. So I think that's one of the things that I've kind of been able to take away from from this experience. Let's go back to those early days, obviously, maybe not in kindergarten, but you know, when, <laughs> when did you learn that, or when did that click? Like, hey, you know what, I really like engineering and, and I'm, I'm intrigued by that. What, when did you start getting that, that passion for it? Yeah, that's a great question. Cause I feel like I have maybe a bit of an unconventional answer. Uh, honestly, I didn't really know anything about engineering. I didn't know I wanted to be an engineer really until college. My high school, we, it was a great high school in a lot of ways, but we didn't like back, back then, you know, however, 10 years ago there, I feel like engineering was just starting to become really popular. Um, and there was a lot, they were starting to have these programs where there were outreach programs where you could like sit in and learn about engineering or take a class or two, which is not something I did. So I applied to colleges as an astrophysics major. I applied everywhere as an astrophysics major. I wrote my college essays on black holes, um, because I knew I loved space and I really liked my AP physics classes. So after I applied and got accepted to colleges as an astrophysics major is when I first started thinking about engineering. And I guess it was a conversation that at some point during my senior year of high school with my biology honors teacher, 
Mrs. Walden, who's one of my favorite teachers to this day. And I very vividly remember the moment where she looked at me and she's like, Brooke, you should be an engineer. And I was just, I looked at her and I was like, thanks. Like, that sounds like a nice compliment. Um, but I didn't really know what that meant. So, but she put it in my head. So then I, you know, got accepted as an astrophysics major and was like, maybe I should think about this engineering thing. So it wasn't until I got to Lehigh and like freshman year started talking to some of the deans of engineering about what mechanical engineering was, what industrial engineering was, what chemical engineering was, and decided to switch pretty much day one into engineering. So I know, you know, space is huge for you, obviously, as you just kind of hinted at, but as you've talked about over, you know, the course of of the podcast, I mean, what was that transition? Because I mean, astrophysics, it's still, you know, kind of on that STEM realm, right, of engineering, physics, it's, it's all math at this point, right? So how was that transition for you mentally of like, okay, I'm going down this space path to now let's go more mechanical? Yeah, I think I... I cut, so I decided to do engineering, but I didn't really let go of my passion for the stars. And part of the reason I honestly ended up picking mechanical engineering at Lehigh was because one of the things they told me was that it'd be like you can do an aerospace engineering minor pretty easily, which is how like the you're, you can if you select the right electives you can have an aerospace engineering minor when you graduate. And that kind of sold me, honestly, on mechanical engineering. So I always find it so interesting because I feel like everyone has a different story of how they found engineering, how they knew they wanted to be an engineer. Um, And I feel like there's kind of this expectation, a little bit of a like, oh, you were, you know, young and always putting this stuff together and you knew you wanted to build things and you knew you loved cars or whatever it is. And that's just really not... I think that's a great story and it's just not mine. So I did mechanical engineering with the aerospace engineering minor and then really sought out the opportunity to do astrophysics research my senior year to bring it full circle for myself, just because that was something I was interested in and knew that wasn't the path I pursued at Lehigh, but kind of wanted to experience it a little bit. So went to the astrophysics department, spoke to a couple professors and got a little bit of a taste for it uh, to wrap up my college experience. Well, cool. And I think that's, you're, you're referencing uh, the Kelp project. Is that correct? Yeah. I did a little bit of research with uh, professor Joshua Pepper, looking at some test data and trying to analyze like really bright stars and build a pipeline using, using Python. So it was a definitely a bit of a different kind of project than I had gone to do with my mechanical engineering and aerospace engineering minor, but it was so much fun and it was definitely a challenge. I was lucky to have a partner who actually was an astrophysics major. So that helped a little bit to have her perspective. And also like the professor I was doing it with was, was so cool. Honestly, like he was so cool. He had done so much in this field. He had built his entire life around it. He, had helped with these telescopes and had so much experience with the data. So it was, I think it was fun to see one, just how much data is out there. I mean, that's one of the things with these telescopes is anyone can access the data. Anyone can do their own analysis. Uh, And there's literally millions, I think it's up to 10 billion stars and data points that you can find just with the test telescope. So it was, it was super fun. So I was getting a little bit of a taste for space while in college. I was doing that. And then I got to do the aerospace engineering minor. And one of the professors at Lehigh was an astronaut. So I obviously took all the classes I could that he taught for the aerospace minor. He is my favorite professor at Lehigh. And it was always so interesting just to listen to him talk about his, exp- like, you know, he was literally an astronaut. Like he went into space and he would just like, nonchalant like tell these stories about you know him on the rocket the mission that he was on helping like prepare like repair this stuff up there and it was he was just so cool I it made me like kind of want to be an astronaut but I'm also a little bit afraid of space so I know maybe that isn't the right role for me (laughs) 
Yeah, and that's you know I I've worked around a couple of astronauts and had that that opportunity as well, and it's they're just so like yeah sure you know I was up there on the space station and with the cosmonauts and yeah right. no big deal and you're just like, no big deal what? <laughs> <laughs> you're just floating around in space looking at the like getting to look down at Earth and like it, yeah just another day on the job <laughs> yeah yeah no it's it's super fun what's kind of let's kind of stick with space a little bit I guess what. What are you excited about? I know we just had Artemis One launch, um, and you know, so that's the the path to the moon, and then eventually to Mars. You know, it's a different way of doing it, though, right? So it was always the shuttle was NASA, and it was all NASA, NASA, NASA. But now with with Artemis, it's it's contracts, it's Boeing, it's Lockheed, it's it's Northrop Grumman, it's all the and NASA, right? All working together. So you know, there's a lot more opportunity for engineers and and who what what have you all across the board what what are you excited about kind of in that kind of in the future of space and and where we're heading yeah i think it's a super exciting time um with the with the artemis missions i i really feel like this is the start of the new space age for us uh i think so much discover first of all we have the james webb space telescope which launched last year which is already up there looking at light and planets and solar systems way beyond our own and discovering so much on a day-to-day basis. And now we have the Artemis mission, which was a successful launch. Um, And with so many more Artemis missions to come, we have Europa missions coming up, which I also think is really cool. Um, I feel like if there's one place in the solar system that people are like pretty excited about from any kind of potential of life. It's Jupiter's moon Europa. So there's so much going on right now and so much up and coming. And I think the Artemis missions are so fun to watch develop. I think a lot of people who've been in the space industry are excited that we're hopefully going to see a man and woman land and walk on Mars um, in their lifetime. And All of these projects, like between, you know, building a base on the idea of building a base on the moon, making space more accessible, putting up the gateway so we can get to Mars, which you've heard me say on other podcasts, I I don't think I can even comprehend at all just how far away Mars is. Like, it sounds like, oh, it's Mars. It's it's right there, which it's totally not. And especially once you factor humans into the equation, you can't just really turn around and come back if something happens. So all of these movies are starting to kind of become a reality. And you have, there's so much problem solving and so much creativity that has to go into all of this, as well as obviously science and physics and math and engineering to make this happen. But to be able to explore, to have humans explore new worlds, obviously we have some rovers and stuff that have been exploring and are exploring Mars and some other planets. But that's a huge step in space advancement and development. And I think it's going to make people really excited. It definitely makes me really excited and can be the start of exploration for even beyond Mars. Um, So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see, see what comes from all of this and to watch it happen. I mean, I to watch the rovers land on Mars would like give me goosebumps. I remember watching it and, you know, hoping everything goes right. And to just to the thought of to watch first of all put humans back on the moon, make a make bases there, and then put people on Mars, it'll be historic. It's a really exciting time, you know. I remember when, you know, I when I, in a previous life I was uh, actually with Northrop Grumman, and we were doing the the SRB for you know for these missions and saw the test fires of of the the first one, you know, which was which was cool to see that they took old technology and just advanced it, but it has advanced so much more in all the other technologies. It was a, that was an exciting time watching that launch. I was, you know, I stayed up late, watched, tried to watch it three different times and finally, you know, it got off the ground and uh, super cool and exciting to see that. And uh, you know, the advancements that we'll see out of, out of this next space race, as you call it, or, you know, new age of space is, is going to be great. So it's an exciting time for sure. Yeah. And there's, and the thing about space and one of the reasons I find it so intriguing is that there's just like so much unknown, like other, other than maybe our, I feel like our ocean, which 
we don't know too much about, which is always a bit surprising, but it's a very harsh environment. We, we barely know anything about space. We know less than 95% of what makes up the universe. There's so many unanswered questions between like dark matter, dark energy, black holes. There's multiverse theories, higher dimensions, like all this stuff, particles and forces that are yet to be discovered. And it just leads us to more questions than answers sometimes. And I find that so interesting. So we're putting up this technology and it's forcing innovation and it's forcing advancement to try and answer some of these fundamental questions. And that's what the James Webb Space Telescope is trying to do right now. It's trying to, you know, look at light from the past, from the early universe, try and try and answer some of the fundamental questions of how we got here um, and and how. So, yeah, I, I feel like there could be some big breakthroughs and that's what these missions are, are trying to do. Yeah, for sure. No, it's super exciting time uh, and can't wait to see what the future holds. Um, well, let's, let's kind of, we kind of tangented there, but love it because <laughs> I will talk about space. I'm kind of a geek about it as well. Um, but yeah. it's, you know, right. It's, and especially seeing some of the, like the actual work goes into it, but, um, let's jump back over to the work you're doing now. Cause it's different. It's not space. Um, what, what are some of the fun projects that you're currently working on, uh, that you can obviously talk about, but that really get you excited in your day-to-day work? I'm actually going to take a spin on this question, if that's okay. Oh, okay. Uh, (laughs) Instead of maybe right now, um, I think it's a good opportunity to shout out maybe one of the projects that I have worked on in the past. um, And that was the XPRIZE Women's Safety Competition that I was a part of, which was back in college, but was probably one of was probably the coolest project that I've ever been a part of. And like many things in life, it kind of came about unexpectedly and turned into so much more than we ever could have hoped for. So I'll talk a little bit about that project, if that's if that's okay. Yeah, uh, I, I feel like that was one of my first, probably the first real engineering project where we got to put out a product and work on something with with hopefully, I guess, like a bigger impact. Uh, So XPRIZE, for people who don't know, put on these competitions that really try to inspire innovation and push technology. So they look at these real world problems and then they create these competitions for them. So the one that me and a team of undergraduates from Lehigh participated in back in 2018, 2017, 2018, was the Women's Safety XPRIZE competition, which was launched out of Mumbai, India. And the goal was to find a solution that would allow communities to rapidly respond to threats against any of its members, ensuring that the help was always reliable. So a big issue is connectivity, which does relate kind of to what I'm doing now. Connectivity is is a big part of it. And so if you're in like these remote countries or areas and you aren't able to get help or you're in a dangerous situation, that's a big problem. So we entered this competition. I think there were around 95 teams that entered and we ended up being one of the final five teams. The only undergraduate team we got to present our design in Mumbai, India (laughs) to a panel of these very accredited and very real judges and experts in the field demonstrating a device that actually worked. So it had to be able to autonomously trigger like a signal. So you you could push a button or it had to be able to do something to let someone know that you needed help. You had to be able to transmit the information. And it also had to be affordable, which is one of the reasons we were actually able to do this competition because it had to cost no more than 40 US dollars to make and manufacture. And uh, even though we had Lehigh backing us and had some funding, that was pretty important that we didn't have to make something that was hundreds of thousands of dollars to so even prototype. So it was quite an iter- iterative design process where, and you were also trying to make it in, like inconspicuous because some people are in situations, if it's like a domestic situation where you they don't really want their partner to know that they have this or whoever they're around, or sometimes 
the person who needs this doesn't have money to be able to afford it, which is why they wanted it to be really affordable. So it had this really great mission that we were all so passionate about that could make a real impact, could really help others around the globe. Um, And that's how this group kind of formed. It was, we heard about the competition, we kind of just put some feelers out, got a bunch of people together and took it for a ride. I mean, we absolutely did not expect to make Final Five. and get the coverage that it did, but it, it was one of the most in, inspirational and global experiences that I've ever had. I mean, we're in India presenting our design with the teams that from all over the world that were also working on this common goal and this common mission. So that was a project that I really enjoyed. And we did get to bring a concept from paper. I literally remember one of the team members drawing like with just a pencil and paper, like a sketch of what maybe this would look like to something that we actually prototyped and used and programmed. And I was more on the hardware side of things. I remember literally one of my teammates went and got a soldering iron in India and we were soldering in the hotel room to try and (laughs) make the thing work. I mean, it was crazy. Uh, But kind of like this experience with the podcast, it was an opportunity that I met people that I absolutely never would have met. I have friends from it that I'm still friends with to this day. And it's one of the most exciting and valuable experiences that I've had, I feel like, as a young engineer. That's great. No, that and that's those are the kind of projects that when they mean that much, right? That'll be with you forever. Did anything ever come out of that? Did it did it make it into production or anything like that? What with us all graduating, we kind of, it didn't, it didn't go too far. So we didn't ultimately win. We made final five, but the team that won, um, I'm pretty sure their product is out on the market. They, they won the prize pot to be able to hopefully produce it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it was definitely a big push. And I think there's a lot of technology that has come out of it um, and inspired other companies as well to be able to give hopefully these communities and different people over the world access to help because safety honestly shouldn't be a privilege. Yeah, for sure. No, it's, it's an important one. What um, kind of, you know, looking back at a cool project you worked on, what's something that you would say maybe if, you, if the door was wide open, what would be your dream project that you'd work on uh, today? <laughs> oh my gosh, a dream project. Um, I, I have so many things I would love to work on. I mean, in a college, I took one class with the professor that was an astronaut where you could like design a mission um, anywhere you wanted. It was called like space system, spacecraft system design, something like that. And my team and I, we designed a mission to one of Neptune's moons, train, Triton, just because I was, I've always loved Neptune. I don't know, maybe because it's the furthest planet out there, maybe because it was always depicted as like blue when I was younger. I've always loved Neptune. So uh, we designed a mission there and I, a lot of it, obviously, I mean, there was backed by science and engineering, but obviously a lot of it was theoretical, but I would love to do something like that. <clears throat> I think as a Oh my God, I'm losing my voice now. <clears throat> I think as we like aim to explore more of our universe and more of our solar system, with a lot of it, with the exploring our solar system, I think there's a lot of hope that we also discover more about Earth and our origins and our own planet. Um, so I think that's really important. But I definitely think with so much unknown about exoplanets and different galaxies out there, hopefully the James Webb Space Telescope and maybe the next iteration of it, that would be super cool to work on, will give us just so much more insight to what what is out there, light years and light years away. But I guess some kind of mission design, um, I think that's so cool. I think a lot of that, it seems like some of these missions, it's you dream up and it obviously it takes a lot of years to actually get get it up there or get it happening. But at some point, it kind of feels like, oh, you're designing this like kind of fantasy mission, but to actually see it through and make it a reality, I think is, is so cool. Well, and kind of, I guess on that realm, right. You, when we look at what is space and, and what's out there and there's so much unknown, what do you kind of look at reality versus science fiction? And, and what do you see that relationship maybe between engineering and 
and and reality and science fiction? I honestly think science fiction is so important. I think if we're looking at some of the real roots for why I wanted to be an engineer and why I love science and why I love some of these mysteries, it's because of science fiction. And I think to be able to do some of these things that we hope to be able to do, like as as humanity, I, like just with our desire to explore, which I really do feel like is in our DNA and is our is in our blood. We've been doing this since the beginning of time. Like we want to explore, we want to push the boundary, we want to see what else is out there. It requires so much creativity, which science fiction I think does so well. I mean, you read some of these books, and a lot of times they kind of predict some of the technology and some of the engineering years ahead of when we can actually have it in production. But just to get people thinking about different ways to do things or to kind of look at the crazy idea and think maybe we can make it happen, I think is so important. So these books and these movies, I I think have inspired a lot of engineers and ultimately will inspire a lot of the missions and technology and capabilities that we have. We're, we're on our way to put people on Mars. Um, I think that'll be a huge jump. And will be a huge testament to our engineering capabilities and success just to be able to do that. So I think that'll happen. I'm excited to see that happen. Um, I, the one thing I, I don't know, I, I kind of love all of it. I mean, there's a lot of like theoretical physics that I think are, is so interesting as I kind of mentioned, right? Like there's so much about, like theories about black holes, like, are we living in a black hole? Could they tell, could they bring us, like, are we in our own black hole? Could we use it to get to a different universe? Like the, the multiverse theory, all this stuff about that. I like listen to videos all the time about this stuff. Like I, I like literally do my walks outside listening to like Star Talk radio and Neil deGrasse Tyson or watching like PBS Space Time on YouTube. And I mean, so, so much of this stuff, I think I think what makes it so cool is that it sounds it sounds kind of crazy. Like and you base movies on these like on time travel, like you said, on wormholes, on on all the on multiverses, on all these things that maybe one day might just prove itself to be true. I mean, there's a huge question right now if we're alone in the universe. Another question that the James Webb Space Telescope is maybe trying to give us an indicator of looking at different like signals and different chemistry from the atmospheres of exoplanets. But so we have so many alien movies out there and, you know, will they look how we expect? I don't know, probably not. And me being so scared of octopus, I really hope the life that we find in the universe is not in the form of like an octopus because that'd be a huge disappointment for me. And there's some theories out there that that's what it could be. But I mean, I read like Project Hail Mary, which the like alien creature that you ultimately like fall in love with is basically like this huge spider. And there's a lot of people that don't love spiders, but you end up falling in love with the main character, Rocky. And I I mean, what a game changer that would be if we actually found life of any kind in the universe, which I think there ultimately has to be because it just seems too impossible that there isn't, but I think that would change humanity's entire perspective of ourselves and who we are and what we're doing if we found out that we weren't alone. Right now, it's all kind of talk, but the day that it becomes a reality, I don't know, it'll change humanity. What do you think, you know, kind of looking at some of these possibilities and and, and for the future, but in in kind of in back to the real world and, and back to earth, if you will, as far as engineering, what do you see in the next five, 10 years, maybe of some advancements that, that are being maybe worked on or theorized about now that you could really see happening? Yeah. So I think the guests on the show have really given me a perspective about that as well. We've talked a lot of to guests about emerging technology in the automotive world, obviously electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, there's a lot with artificial intelligence and robotics that are up and coming. Uh, I think all of that is stuff we'll probably see before we get to some of the crazy advancements in space travel, though 
we're all we're clearly working on it. But I think those advancements are really interesting. We also have a lot of advancements clearly in sustainability. We've had some people on the show talk about um, lately. We've had people talk about the the power grid and how important that will be, which I think will be a huge factor ultimately in space because our world completely relies on our ability to have electricity and energy and uh, be able to use it. So all these things I think are really going to translate. And it's really cool to see how the advancements in one field can lead to advancements in another. Um, I know there's, it's even been mentioned that on the James Webb Space Telescope, because of the optics, that how precise and amazing those optics are, they've seen advancements in the medical field um, using that kind of technology. So I think one of the big lessons is that, you know, it kind of seems like siloed fields, but really there's so much overlap, um, especially in industries where you're dealing with harsh environments. So harsh environments or just like safety critical industries. So there's, I think a lot of overlap. I think there's a lot coming. And nowadays it's, I feel kind of like exponential the because the technology we're creating um, is evolving so fast and that just allows us to do so much more. So it kind of keeps pushing the ceiling. And yeah, I'm I'm excited. I mean, I think, you know, we've had people talk about it, especially on like the sustainability side and like the earth side of things. Um, there's a lot important happening there. So you know, you even see it in the Martian, we got to be able to grow food and we got to be able to like sustain life. <laughs> um, and if you want to put people somewhere, you got to keep the people alive. So all of that's important. That's something that Earth does. And I, I think sometimes we don't appreciate fully. Um, it was funny. I was actually I have this mug, of course, you know, it has like all the planets on it that my mom got me from a museum, of course, my souvenir. And I sent a picture to my friend and I was like, what's your which one's your favorite planet? And he replied back and he was like, Earth. And I was like, I was like, you know what? I feel like that should be the answer. Like that should be more people's answer. Um, It's not the like exciting answer. Like obviously Saturn's rings are so cool. Jupiter's awesome. I obviously have a love for Neptune, but it's true. We kind of got to keep Earth um, in the front of mind. Well, we do live here. So it is a very important. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. It's important. If we want to be able to do anything, we got (laughs) to, we got to be able to live here and do stuff here so yeah and it's it i always love that there's that photo from one of the rovers or something where it's it's on mars right and it's it's just this little pin is earth you know and it just puts it in perspective because i'll go outside and i look up and there's mars right there's jupiter there's there's all these other planets that you can see just as a star but it's obviously just the planet but when you see it from another planet back to earth of how small and you know how small we are but it's all here and yeah there's some there's some something about that i i love that answer yeah and i think it brings up another point just about like perspective like perspective is so important um you know, I agree. Like, for, I love looking at the night sky. I stand out there with my app, like looking to <laughs> see light. And it's like, oh, you could see Mars. You could sometimes you could see Jupiter. Um, when I went on a trip to Canada, we went to the planetarium in Jasper, and you could like look through the telescope and see uh, Saturn's rings. And you were standing in kind of like a dark zone. And I didn't get to see the Northern Lights, but maybe one day. Uh, but yeah, I think perspective is everything in in really every situation, and that's why it's so that's one of the reasons I've loved this podcast is you get so many different perspectives from people. And I think that's really key. And I think that's how we're going to be able to do so much as a society and just as I guess, like a civilization to be able to advance these things is because of all the different perspectives. And I've loved kind of learning about how people think through problems and how you get such different answers to the same question. And with everyone's different experiences, it, it makes it really interesting to, to be able to hear what they think of something. Yeah, it's been, it's been a, a journey and it's been fun to, to listen to all those different, you know, I think back to, to Asher, right? And he's talking about this cup, you know, and, and just the, the nature and like the way that the different materials work together, you know, and uh, I loved that. It's, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I feel like that's also a great example because like for me, 
I'm not very good at art. Like I don't create my own, like I'm, that's just not something that I, I do. And there's always a funny story from when I was like in high school and I had to take studio art and we had to build these clay, you had to build something with clay. And I literally tried to leave air bubbles in mine so it would blow up in the kiln because I heard you got a hundred on it if it blew up and I mine was terrible. And also it didn't work, by the way. I literally <laughs> tried to leave air bubbles in it and it didn't even work. But like, so obviously that's not my area of expertise. Clearly I'm also not very good at it. But to hear him talk about it, exactly, like you're you're like in a trance. It's so interesting just the way he tells the story. And like storytelling is so important. And he was great at that. Yeah, he was he was fun to listen to. Also beta and how he created, you know, these little I think it was rabbits or something <laughs> for his kids to play with, right? It was kind of like on that realm. I mean, you're not an artist, right? But you say, but what about tinkering? Do you like to build models or tinker with any engineering type stuff? Yeah. So here's another question I'm going to take maybe an unconventional answer to because so we talk, I feel like tinkering at the heart of tinkering is like being creative and it's a creative outlet. And I think when we talk to a lot of people on the show, that's what it is for them. You know, sometimes it's a way to you create these little 3D models or you create these little mechanisms for your kids and it's a way to connect with your kids or for Asher it was a creative outlet and maybe even a business to be able to create these different things. Uh, I will say that's not really what I do. I think my creative outlet is a little bit different. Like I am, I love sports. Like I play a lot of sports. To me, that's kind of my creative outlet. Um, in my next life, I'll be a gymnast. I have such an admiration for the sport. And so I kind of love pushing the boundaries, like in that sense with myself, with what, what kind of like, can I, can I accomplish in, in these different sports? And it's also, I feel like I love creating connections. So like, that's kind of my creativity in a way, like <clears throat> in a lot of groups, like I'm the person that will plan events. Like I always joke that one of the things I'm best at is execution. Cause like when I want something to happen, like I will, I'll make it happen. And sometimes that's plans with friends or um, sometimes it's something in sports. Like I'm determined to get this, this thing in gymnastics or trapezing or volleyball or whatever it is. So my, my tinkering and my creative outlet is, is more like activities with, with people. I feel like that's like really kind of what, but like satisfies and satisfies, satisfies that urge for me. And I mean, I'll try anything. I kind of always joke, like, especially sports. I clearly like some high adrenaline stuff. I mean, I trapeze, um, that I would, I would bungee jump, which I know my mom doesn't like the answer to, but so <laughs> that's kind of my, my version of it. I, I make plans. I like to see people. I like to get to know people. Um, and I like to kind of, push the boundaries within myself. Okay, cool. What, I mean, obviously, you know, that kind of stemmed from talking about Asher and Beta. What are, what were some of the best moments that, or, you know, best conversations that you had uh, throughout the show? Yeah, I think, I think all the conversations kind of had their highlight moments and the best parts of them were when someone was talking about something that you could just tell they loved. Uh, for whatever their reason was, whether it was something that they they built or they tinkered with um, or a project they were working on or when we were I mean, obviously, I love the conversations where we were talking about some of the science fiction stuff and uh, and could connect in that realm. Uh, I definitely enjoy talking about uh, propul like ionic pr ion propulsion with Asher, because that's kind of an area that I think is up and coming and propulsion systems will probably have to advance or we will see some advancements with them as we explore space. But yeah, each person talking, like hearing their backstory and hearing why they love what they do or what impact they're trying to make, I found so interesting. And honestly, like I said, I learned a lot along the way. Like I didn't know anything about vertical farming before that episode. So that was an opportunity for me to kind of learn about that and some of the episodes where we talked about autonomous driving and stuff in the automotive industry like at that point I was in the automotive industry but kind of working on like a different 
like working on it differently. So to hear someone who works on it at a different stage in the process, or maybe from like a software point of view, um, I thought was really interesting. And that kind of expanded my perspective and my take on the field and, you know, what we're doing and what our customers are doing, what our competitors are doing, what just everyone is trying to do as, as we try and develop and innovate. Cool. No, it, yeah, it's been it's been fun. Well, and I know the one question you ask everybody is, "Oh gosh, <laughs> yeah, right here it comes." What's oh, what no. is your X factor? I have been thinking a lot about this question because obviously you have to ask me. I I do ask everyone. That was one of like the signature questions. So I th- I think maybe my X factor. It's perhaps a few things, and it's the particular combination of them that makes them an X factor. And I think it's probably a combination of my enthusiasm, my genuine interest in getting to know other people and create connections, an appreciation for the unknown and a desire to explore even the things that scare me, Um, competitiveness, um, execution and probably at the heart of everything, empathy. So I think it's it's the combination of those things. Um, I always joke that I'm very. Co- it's not a joke, actually. It's completely true that I am a super com- a super competitive person, which you don't always see because a lot of it is within myself. I think that comes from sports. You know, like I want to be the best volleyball player, the best tennis player, the best gymnast that I can be to whatever my capability is. But uh, other than because I've played sports and because I'm so competitive, I also recognize how important it is to have a team around you. Like I, I grew up playing volleyball it was a team sport. And while obviously I wanted to be as good as I could be, and I was always the hardest on myself, we ultimately all need each other and we all need everyone around us. Like no one will ever know the answer to every single question. Like you'll never know everything. And it's about knowing who to ask and it's about knowing who to talk to. And those, those connections with people are so important. And I remember starting at TE, you know, my first corporate, my first job, my first real job, like out of college and someone gave me advice and they were like, be, just be a nice person, like be nice to work with. Like you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You don't have to have the answer to every question, but like people will help you if you're nice, like if you're a nice person. And it's honestly so true. Like you want to help people more if they're, if they're easy to work with, if they're nice. And, and that I think like genuine interest and genuine like satisfaction I get in getting to know people um, goes a long way. And especially these days where we're so virtual, like getting to know people behind the computer screen and understanding that, you know, and I guess until we meet some aliens, <clears throat> we're all human. <laughs> we're all human. Everyone, everyone has stuff going on. I think empathy is is super, super important. And the leaders that I respect the most are the ones that obviously can execute. They're obviously smart. They've obviously done something right. But above all, they're they have empathy and they have sympathy for other people and they care about the people <clears throat> around them. So. I, that's something I respect in others. And I, I try, I try to be for others as well. Well, no, and I, that's a, I think a great way to, to, to say it. And, and also a great way to kind of close this out is, as now we get the opportunity to learn more about you, uh, since we've been learning about all your guests, uh, throughout the show. So, uh, Brooke, I just want to say thank you so much. This is, this has been, uh, my pleasure interviewing you today, uh, and having really enjoyed watching you over the last uh, episodes and interviewing everybody else. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure and honor to be the host of the show. Uh, Like I said, an opportunity I wouldn't have necessarily ever guessed that I would have, and I've grown a lot and it's furthered my love for getting to know people and geeking out as you guys would say about upcoming technology and the different trends happening. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity. All right. Well, Thanks for joining us. Uh, And with that, thank you for joining our special episode. Uh, Come back next time by subscribing to the show on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. And until next time, think big, move fast, and make every connection count.